נפילות, ממש לידינו. In an escalation of hostilities that has rocked the Middle East, the Lebanese resistance forces have launched a significant retaliatory campaign against Israeli occupation forces in Palestine. Information reaching the OMT news team confirms that a series of devastating 200 missile strikes have targeted occupation forces, followed by a wave of coordinated 100 drone strikes aimed at destabilizing occupation defense force, ODF, command and control structures. These acts of resistance mark a turning point in the ongoing conflict, as the Lebanese forces intensify their operations in response to what they perceive as blatant occupation and aggression by Israel. The most critical development in this unfolding conflict was the firing of at least seven missiles into the Israeli settlement of Metula, located near the Lebanese border. These missiles struck key infrastructure within the settlement, resulting in significant damage and fires breaking out across various locations. Israeli media has reported casualties among its forces stationed in Metula, though the full extent of the damage and the number of injuries or fatalities remains unclear. The scope of the Lebanese resistance's retaliation has reached unprecedented levels. Reports indicate that within a single day, 17 rocket and drone attacks were launched against Israeli military positions. These attacks targeted bases in Shomera, Matat, and the headquarters of the 810th Herman Brigade in the Ma'al Galani barracks, illustrating the precision and intensity of the resistance's operations. The forces also fired rockets at Zarit and Matula, while shelling military positions at Hanita, Ramya, and Al Malikia. The scale and coordination of these attacks represent a new phase in the conflict between the Lebanese resistance and Israeli forces. This escalation comes in the context of heightened tensions along the Lebanon-Israel border, where both sides have been trading fire daily since October 8th, the day after Israel launched its war on Gaza. While the Lebanese resistance has concentrated its attacks on military targets, occupation forces have frequently targeted non-military sites in Lebanon. These strikes have resulted in civilian casualties, with dozens of Lebanese citizens losing their lives. The tragic loss of civilian lives underscores the broader consequences of the conflict, as both sides continue to engage in a relentless exchange of fire. On one side, Lebanese resistance forces maintain their focus on strategic military objectives, while on the other, occupation forces appear to widen the scope of their airstrikes to include civilian areas, a tactic often used to demoralize and terrorize the population. In a significant escalation of their own, Israeli warplanes carried out one of the largest airstrikes in southern Lebanon since the beginning of the conflict. These airstrikes targeted Lebanese settlements, alleged resistance positions, and military launchers, although independent verification of the exact nature of the targets remains elusive. Given Israel's track record of targeting civilian infrastructure in conflict zones, it is not unreasonable to suspect that a substantial portion of these airstrikes were aimed at civilian areas maximizing destruction and further exacerbating the humanitarian toll on the Lebanese people. The leader of the resistance in Lebanon, Hassan Nasrallah, responded to these developments by warning that any further Israeli incursions into Lebanon 
would be considered a full-scale declaration of war. Nasrallah's statement reflects the growing concern that the conflict could expand beyond isolated skirmishes along the border and evolve into a broader regional confrontation. His emphasis on the occupation's plan to invade Lebanon underscores the Lebanese resistance's readiness to defend its territory and people against what it views as foreign aggression. Over 11th month, in they give them some appointments. There will be an, an, an all-out war after two days, after one week. For 11 months, we're, we're living this kind of... Um, uh, environments. This was all pressure on the Lebanon, on the resistance movement, on all the, uh, and in particular on Hezbollah, a pressure so that this front would stop killing and assassination and killing some of the individuals and soldiers, uh, demolishing some of the houses and terrorizing people. Um, breaking the sound, the, the, the sound of the wall sound um, in the south. This hit was in this context. All of these attempts did not actually achieve any uh, result, and came to this, and resorted to this um, way, which is the highest criminal uh, uh, method. Uh, what uh, it was trying, what the enemy is saying is trying to neutralize only the military, but it, it has actually hit the civilians. This big hit, um, I'm not analyzing here, but on Tuesday afternoon, after the operation, hours later, we've received letters to some, not, to some of the channels through formal and informal channels. Our target from this hit so that you stop supporting Gaza and to stop uh, the Lebanese uh, front, um, we have more. And we will have more. And the more was on Wednesday. So the aim or the target is very clear. Maybe somebody go for further than that, but that this hit that was preliminary, it will be preemptive, and there will be uh, in uh, Marwan Bashara is a political scientist, and, so and he offered one of the best analyses. Voice that uh, clearly underlines that the, the man is down, right? But he is at the same time defiant. Clearly, the attacks of the past forty-eight hours uh, have uh, you know have got to him and to his organization, and clearly he understands that it's a major blow to Hezbollah. There's absolutely no doubt about that. It's uh, even a blow to his leadership. It's a blow to the credibility of the organizations, to what it uh, holds dear, its secrecy and its uh, meticulous planning and, 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 and so on and so forth. So he is down uh, regarding that issue. I'm not, I'm not sure the word is defeated. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he was very defiant, especially towards the uh, second half of his speech when he uh, said that uh, if, if, uh, if Israel's goal, one main goal is to allow for uh, the 60 plus thousand people from the north to go back to their homes, if that's the goal, we will not allow it to achieve that objective ever, unless there is a ceasefire in Gaza. So I think that part was very clear. And I think the Israelis probably understood that part. And that's why I am afraid that there's going to be some major escalation coming, coming, coming in the, in the days and weeks to come. From which side? But back to the speech, both sides. Look, uh, this is a very, very critical point now. With the war in Gaza almost, almost behind Israel, after a year of genocide and insisting that they will remain there and in the absence of a ceasefire, they're going to focus their attention on Lebanon while they are, of course, doing the horrible crimes they are doing in the West Bank. I think the situation on the Lebanese-Israel border is no longer tenable because Israel is making promises to its people. Netanyahu every day now talks about how uh, the fourth objective, meaning taking people back to their homes in the north, is 
uh, an objective of the war, and uh, his gallant, his defense minister, his military establishments are supporting that. They are already moving troops that way. It's worrying, right? It's worrying. The defiance of Hezbollah that this will never stop unless you stop your aggression against Gaza, I think, now allows for one of two options. The, li the lesser option is, a, is a, an agreement, a diplomatic solution, or an open confrontation. But I want to take us back just quickly to the speech, because I think uh, there are three important points that he made, which neither Josip Bellin nor whoever understands uh, really what is Hezbollah is trying to say. One, he's trying to say that this is imposed on us. It's, it's not a choice. Yes, we, uh, you know, we, we, we started this in support of Gaza, but Israel is imposed on us, on Lebanon, on Palestine, on the Arab world, on the Muslim world, that it's a cancerous ingrowth. It's a cancerous ingrowth in the Arab region. It's imposed on us. It's a danger to us. And, and, and this confrontation was imposed on us by Israel, and hence we have no choice but to resist. So the, the approach of Hezbollah and Hamas and others, that if they are resisting, they are not on the offensive, that they are on the defensive. The second important point is that Israel doesn't seem to understand the, 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 the belief system of Hezbollah and Hamas that this is, uh, uh, you know, a religious, a, 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 a belief system, a nationalist system that will not simply be broken by military uh, tools or by better technology. That this is deep rooted with Hezbollah and its followers, like with Hamas, like others, and they will not be broken. And third and last is that, yes, they might have won the past two days and they could be smug about it. They could even win for the next two years and 20 years. But it's history. They believe in history. Hezbollah and Hamas don't believe that this is a two days, a two year, a two decade conflict, not even a century conflict. They believe this is a long, long term conflict. And they're there. The region is Arab Muslim. Israel is an, a cancerous ingrowth as they see it. Israel's occupation military, meanwhile, has been quick to emphasize the magnitude of its airstrikes, with the Occupation Defense Force, ODF, claiming that its fighter jets struck over 100 rocket launchers in southern Lebanon. According to the ODF, these launchers were primed for immediate strikes on Israeli settlements, including a total of 1,000 launch barrels. Additionally, Israeli forces targeted several buildings and a weapons depot belonging to the Lebanese resistance in various parts of southern Lebanon. This campaign, however, must be viewed in the context of Israel's broader military strategy, which often involves preemptive strikes on potential threats, albeit at the cost of significant collateral damage. In response to the intensifying conflict, the ODF issued new guidelines for Israeli civilians living in northern communities near the Lebanese border, instructing them to stay close to bomb shelters and avoid unnecessary movements. These guidelines applied to civilians in regions such as Merom Hagalil, Upper Galilee, Mevaot HaHermon, Yesud Hama'ala, and towns in the Golan Heights, among others. The ODF urged people to avoid large gatherings and to guard the entrances to their communities, reinforcing the pervasive sense of insecurity that has gripped northern Israel. As the situation continues to evolve, ODF Defence Minister Yoav Gallant characterised the conflict as entering a new phase in the war, reflecting Israel's growing concern about the expanding capabilities and reach of the Lebanese resistance. The increasing frequency and sophistication of resistance attacks, combined with the strategic targeting of key military installations, pose a significant challenge to Israel's military dominance in the region. ורצף הפעולות הצבאיות והביטחוניות שלנו יימשך. היעד שלנו הוא להחזיר את תושבי הצפון אל בתיהם בביטחון. ככל שחולף הזמן, חיזבאללה ישלם מחיר הולך וגובר. Before the devastating missile strikes on Matula, the Lebanese resistance had already inflicted damage on Israeli forces with a successful strike on the Almag military installation near the Lebanese border. The resistance claimed that this attack, conducted with appropriate weapons, 
resulted in numerous casualties among Israeli forces. In a statement, the Lebanese forces emphasized that their actions were in solidarity with the Palestinian people in Gaza, signaling that their retaliation was as much a part of the broader struggle for Palestinian liberation as it was a response to Israeli aggression against Lebanon. This intensification of hostilities between the Lebanese resistance and European occupiers of Palestine is occurring against the backdrop of occupation's brutal military campaign in Gaza. The ongoing war, which began in early October, has resulted in widespread destruction and a staggering loss of life in Gaza, with Palestinian civilian casualties mounting by the day. The Lebanese resistance's retaliation, therefore, is not just a local response to Israeli occupation, but a demonstration of broader regional solidarity with the Palestinian cause. Meanwhile, the recent statements made by Mohsen Rezaieh, a member of Iran's Expediency Discernment Council, paint a sobering picture of the potential ripple effects of what he refers to as industrial terrorism carried out by the Israeli regime. In a post on his social media account, Reza AI accused Israel of engaging in a systematic and calculated campaign of assassinations, facilitated by stolen technology from other nations. His warning that both the United States and Europe could become future victims of this industrialized terrorism is not just provocative rhetoric, but a signal of deep concerns about how technological advancements in warfare are being weaponized in increasingly clandestine and destructive ways. Let's unpack this concept of industrial terrorism and why Rizaye's words, though alarming, demand careful consideration. Industrial terrorism, in this context, refers to the use of highly sophisticated, mass-produced technology to carry out targeted killings, sabotage and other forms of violence. The claim here is that Israel has managed to weaponize technologies, perhaps surveillance, communication or military hardware, on a scale that allows it to conduct widespread attacks with chilling efficiency. In this case, it's alleged that Israel is not developing these technologies independently, but rather appropriating advancements from other nations, possibly through espionage or backdoor deals. Reza AI's assertion that Israel's actions amount to mass, blind and cowardly assassination points to the indiscriminate nature of the attacks, where the line between military targets and civilian casualties becomes dangerously blurred. The most recent attack in Lebanon, where thousands of wireless communication devices exploded in various locations, tragically killing at least eight people and injuring 2,800 more, seems to fit this narrative. These devices, likely utilised by members of the resistance movement, turn from tools of communication into instruments of death. Whether the technology behind these attacks was indeed stolen, as Reza a suggests, or homegrown by Israeli intelligence, the consequences are the same. Civilian lives are lost, and a broader regional destabilization ensues. Consider, for example, the possibility of cyber attacks, drone warfare, or even the manipulation of communication infrastructure. These are all examples of modern warfare tools that can easily slip out of their original context and wreak havoc in far-flung places. If Israeli technology, or technology stolen by Israel, is used to carry out assassinations or sabotage in Lebanon today, there's no reason to think that such capabilities couldn't be repurposed for other targets, either intentionally or through unintended consequences. Reza AI's warning serves as a broader critique of Western complicity in allowing the unchecked rise of these technologies. For decades, the US and European nations have provided military and financial support to Israel, often turning a blind eye to the more controversial aspects of its defence strategy, especially when it comes to its treatment of Palestinians and neighbouring Arab states. By supporting Israel's military-industrial complex, the West has, perhaps inadvertently, contributed to the rise of what Reza Yeh is calling industrial terrorism. And now, Reza Yeh argues, it's only a matter of time before this creation turns against its benefactors.